Hey everyone, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Maddie. I get to be one of the pastors here at Epiphany Station. And since you're at the second worship experience, you already know that today's worship experience is going to look a little bit different from normal. I'm not going to apologize that you couldn't find parking or couldn't get in here. Uh, what we're doing instead of the norm is taking a realistic and I guess more attention filled approach. Uh, to understanding what it means for us to worship together. So at this point, we're going to send all of the kids out. They're going to go up up to E-Kids, and they're going to be here while we have our conversation from God's Word. And then they're going to come back and be down front, and they're going to be here during our worship time, which is going to be after the message. And all of this is wrapped up because we're in our third conversation in the teaching series, finally. Now, finally, this expression of at last... Is something that God declares to his people in the book of Revelation, in which says, at last, finally, there is going to be peace. At last, finally, there is going to be no more pain, and we're going to have perfect community together. It's the expression of God's people that at last, we no longer have to do all of this stuff in this world, but we get to go home. And Revelation expresses numerous things. Our first conversation was all centered in on the purpose of this letter, why it was written and why we have it today. John receiving a vision from Jesus Christ about what is going to happen in the future and really the purpose of all things. Pete, in our second conversation, focused in on the letters written to the churches, the seven churches, seven letters, to help them understand the most important thing is Jesus and to lose sight of Jesus as our first and foremost affection, our first love means that we could end up on the wrong side of eternity. And now, our third conversation is all about worship, spoken and musical worship. We see the layout in Revelation 4. Things take a shift and a turn in which John sees some stuff, and it, it helps inform us what it really means to worship. Now, when you talk about musical worship in the church, almost ashamedly, we have to admit that there is a ridiculous amount of contention division um, based on what should be sung, Uh, what music, what instruments, what volume, what lyrics, it goes on and on and on. Like in the West, it's particularly bad. Uh, I missed it, but in the 90s, there was actually a season of time known as the Worship Wars, in between like uh, more traditional and the contemporaries and churches were fighting, denominations were splitting, like it was insane. All I think a sight and and a symptom that we lose the first love, we lose sight of Jesus Christ and it's very easy for us to get our focus on all of the other things. So we're not here to have a conversation about what worship is right, better or best. We're going to take every bias that you have, because you have some, we're going to take nostalgia and we're going to take preference and we're even going to take church hurt that we've experienced and we're going to try and shelf it this morning. We're going to put it off to one side because when we talk about worshiping our God, it's way too easy for us to make this about us worshiping Him rather than just Him being worshiped. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go into God's Word. We're going to go into what he says about worship, about declaring things to him. Because I believe in Revelation, you actually find some of the purest worship, undefiled worship. The answer to what it should be and and, and how it should be is all in here. So the rest of our time together, we talk about musical worship. We're not talking about 100 years past. We're not talking about the last 10. We're talking about timeless and pure worship. If you've been reading along, you know we're in Revelation chapter 4. I'm going to start it off in verse 1 as things change for John. He says, Then I looked. He says, I looked and I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice, the voice of Jesus that I'd heard before, spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, Come up here and I will show you what must, what must happen after this. And instantly I was in the Spirit. And I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones like jasper and carnelian. And the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. Twenty-four thrones surrounded him and twenty-four elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbles of thunder. And in front of the throne there were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. And in front of the throne 
was a shiny sea of glass sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the thrones were four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. Now John saw these things. It was a revelation from Jesus Christ. He saw these things. They were immediately in front of him. And so he tries to write down, as he's instructed to, and describe what he's seeing. And it's phenomenally hard for him to do. As he describes them, he describes things, it's like this and it's like that. But when a human mind tries to picture what heaven looks like, we can't even come close. John gives you some guidelines, but you can't actually fathom it. You can't wrap your head around it. And I think it's supposed to be this way. It's supposed to be hard to imagine God and his home, his throne room, where he is unveiled completely in his majesty. It's supposed to be unimaginable. Because if we could imagine it, if we could draw pictures of it, if we could create similar spaces like it, that's a pretty small God that we're worshiping. So in this, John experiences and he sees God and he's so very tangible, so very there. He's brilliant. The words that are used are like glowing and flashing and rumbling and burning and shining and sparkling. These are all sensory experiences John is having of God. And they are not small and they are not quiet. They are awesome in power. They are dominant in the space. Consider a peeling of thunder right above your head, lightning flashing in the center of your vision. John is overwhelmed as he approaches the throne of our God, the God that we worship. Now, people and churches have tried to imagine what heaven looks like, and churches have even tried to create um, spaces, worship spaces or, or sanctuaries that try to even reflect something like what worship is like in heaven. You can tell that we didn't really try that hard because we don't believe that you can. You can't create anything like it. Before eternity, before we go home, what we have is this. We have this imagery that John shares with us, and we can seek in here and in here to try and fathom what it would be like to be in his presence. Now, what has this got to do with worship? Everything. Because before a word is said or a word is sung or spoken, what matters most is that we understand who we've come to worship. And who we've come to worship is the God that John describes, that God's word throughout describes, so that we would actually see that we're worshiping something other than what we normally experience. That our focus in worship, it, it shouldn't be the stage. It, it shouldn't be the key that the tune is in, or the tempo, or the instruments, or the people on stage. It shouldn't even be the people that we're surrounded by. These things can become distractors. Our focus is to be on the one who we're singing to. When it comes to pure worship, that's the point. Pure worship can be found in your living room playing Spotify or worship from YouTube or playing on your own piano. It can be found in the smallest run-down Lutheran church in the country that's got a clapped out organ, but they still gather and it's still pure worship. And it can be in the largest gatherings of Christians imaginable at massive stadiums if the intent there is that God would be worshipped. This is what matters most and what has to matter most to us who say that we want to glorify and worship our God. And it helps us to imagine him on his throne. It helps us to picture him in full majesty with nothing held back. And that becomes the foundation upon which you build every other bit of worship. Everything else you would consider comes with that foundation that he's the one we're worshiping and this is who he is. Now let's let the rest of heavenly worship fall down on that foundation. See what it says next in Revelation 4. It said that in front of the throne there was shiny sea of glass sparkling like crystal and then in the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a human face, and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings, 
and their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out. Day after day and night after night, they kept on saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. This is where you get into Revelation, you get into some of like the weird imagery that can kind of throw us off kilter as to what we're talking about. These four living beings, here's the description of them, they're like an ox, like a lion, like an eagle, and one's got a human face. Also, the description of the wings and the eyes, very much in keeping with all the descriptors of angels in heaven. So we have these four living beings all giving glory and worship to God and many different opinions as to why and what they are, something a little unfathomable. Theologians that I ascribe to and my opinion of what they represent in worship is they are the representation of all creation representation of everything God has ever brought into existence, declaring back to him who they know him to be. Then comes the angels. Then I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne of the living beings and the elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven, earth, under earth, in sea, and they sang. Blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And the four living beings said, amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped the lamb. So you see, worship begins in its purest form with all of creation, all of the angels, all directing towards God a declaration of what? Who he is. They simply say to him and they simply sing to him, this is who you are. This is who you always have been. This is who you are and this is who you always will be. And the first words are holy, holy, holy. That means you're different from us. You're above us. You are distinct. You are unchanging. You are unshifting. You are perfect in your goodness. Next comes, and worthy. So worthy of our worship, so worthy of our praise, and their focus is on the Lamb. Wherever you see the Lamb in Revelation, it's in reference to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is pictured as a Lamb, sacrificed, slaughtered, killed on the cross for us. For the sin that would separate us from a holy and perfect God, that we could never be around that, Jesus was killed to restore that relationship, but our faith in him, we could even dare, John could dare to stand in the presence of a perfect and holy God. And because of who he is, blessings and glory and honor and power, all of it is yours. So you start with the foundation. Why do we worship? We're worshiping him. It's not about us. It's not about even what we do. It is about entirely him. And what is the first thing we focus on? Who he is. Who he is has to be at the very core of our worship. Otherwise, worship gets drifty. Worship gets misaligned, misfocused if it's not about him and who he is. And then another form of worship comes next. It says, whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne the one who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. Now the 24 elders, again, that could be confusing. Everyone has thought about this for a long, long time since John wrote this letter. Theologians I ascribe to is an understanding that the 24 elders are representative of all of God's people for all time. Why is this? 24, because we have them start with the first 12 being the first 12 tribal heads of Israel. So as God establishes his people, he does that in 12 tribes. And in these 12 tribes, we get the 12 names of the ones who started them. 
Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Zebulun, Issachar, Dan, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Joseph, and Benjamin. That's the Old Testament. That's the Old Covenant between God and his people through Abraham. And the next 12 are the 12 faithful apostles of Jesus Christ. Simon Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, Simon, James, Jude, and Matthias, who replaced Judas. So why 24 elders? Why? Because God's people, all of them for all time, Old Testament, Old Covenant, New Testament, New Covenant, declare God to the world. They declare worshipfully, he is who he is. That's what they start with, you're worthy of glory and honor and praise, but then they also give worship to some other factor. The next thing they say, if you take back to verse 11, for you created all things. They exist because you created what you pleased. Really, the other element of worship is to worship God for who he is, but we also worship God for what he's done. And their focus is that you chose to create, that you chose to bring us to life, that you chose to reveal yourself, that we still exist now because it pleases you to be in relationship with us. Who God is, what he's done. That's pure worship in heaven. Not one mention of the instruments played, of the lighting, of the sound created by human beings. Not one mention of what we try to do to try and affect what is being said. Not one mention of one thing that Christians get so bent out of shape about when it comes to musical worship of God. Here's what does matter. Attitude. Posture, humility. You are so worthy. You are so holy. You are so much more. And I am pleased to worship you. And how I'm going to worship you is declare truth about you. And that seems to be the purest form of worship. It seems to me that what matters more than where you worship, how you worship, who you worship with, what your preferences are, is that you come to worship Him. Who you come to worship matters more than how you do it. Our focus would be that every time we seek to worship him, our minds would dwell more on who he is than what we're doing. See, I believe bad worship tends to come from a bad view of who God is. When worship is, is a bit about us, it's about me, well, we're missing the point. If I, it is kind of benign and, and just kind of weak and, and, and thin, maybe we've got a very small view of who God is. If God is insignificant to you, then you're not likely to bring heart, focus, and passion to your worship. If he's second in your life, then he will get the dregs. He will get the bottom of the barrel of our attention, affection, our focus, our voice, our movement, everything. Everything. Now, this is something that's plagued Christians forever. As a new believer in Jesus Christ, it was so difficult for me to get to this place where I wanted to sing because I was just focused on wanting to sing. So many people, they just kind of sing laissez-faire or they fake it and, and make it look like they're exuberant in their worship. What matters in worship is more what's going on in the middle, more what goes on here when you look at him and focus on him than anything you're going to do in the external. Great worship, good worship, is a response to knowing who you're worshiping. So good is he, so right is he, so perfect is he, and so involved in you he wants to be, that we would just want to sing, and we would just want to talk. What John has seen, we're waiting to see. And in the meantime, we express ourselves in preparation. Our greatest expressions... Worship goes beyond music, of course it does. The worship of sacrifice of our lives, of, of work and of life and of love and of money. But also music. Spoken words and musical words that would declare something to him that we wouldn't say to anyone else. We don't sing to anyone else these songs of devotion and adoration and affection. When we know who God is, when we're in when we're, our hearts and minds are aligned with who he really is, we will worship like angels. And we will worship like the elders. 
We'll put down our crowns and say, anything I've got to offer, anything at all, I lay it all down in front of you so that every experience of worship becomes truly like going before the throne and giving full attention to him. Now, at Epiphany, one of the things that we try and do before every worship experience is prepare ourselves to worship. It's not something you just turn on. The staff, we pray in preparation for our worship experience and in our planning. All the volunteers gather in the foyer before anyone gets here and we pray together in our huddle and we talk about it. If we have a host come and beginning before we do anything, praise for us to be ready to worship. But no one can actually make you worship genuinely. Nobody can make you and draw you into that place. That's something you get to choose to do when you dwell on him. This is about him today. It's about who he is and it's about what he's done. So I encourage you to prepare you for worship. When you come to that place, Spotify at home, big worship event, doesn't matter. Prepare yourself to worship him by thinking about who he is. I found it difficult to engage in musical worship in the beginning. And I hear that from other people too. And and advice you'll never hear me give is, well, just start singing and, and copy what other people do in the room. No, don't do that. If you're finding it difficult to sing musical worship, or if you're finding it boring, or if you're finding it just lacks something, don't just do it. Stop. And instead, take time to dwell on who your God is. I believe real, genuine worship comes out of that, not just acting it. So go to God's word and have it inform you in revelation who he actually is. See the gospels and what he's actually done for you. Think back over your life and the testimony of his involvement. Then open your mouth. Then think about who God is, about what he's done in the old and what he's doing in the recent. It's what people of God have done for all times. You see in the Bible, songs of worship, when God brought them over the Red Sea and out of Egypt, song of worship. As he provided for them in the wilderness, song of worship. Into the promised land, song of worship. New temple, song of worship. Out of exile, song of worship. When they refound the word of God, song of worship. When Mary heard that she was pregnant, song of worship. When Jesus entered Jerusalem to be killed and people laid down palm leaves and sang, Hosanna, save us now, Hosanna, song of worship. And now for the last 2,000 or so years, the people of God have been singing about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ for what it means to us, that we're not dead anymore, that we can come back to him. We've been singing about the resurrection and the power and the promise of getting to go home. It's all testimony of who he is and what he's done. That's worship. The apostle Paul in the New Testament writes to some people and he says to them, when you gather for worship, Everything should make sense to people. Everything should be in its right order. But the whole point of worship is that amongst the people who are there, they would know God is among them. And God is among us in worship when he is the focus of our worship, when he is the attention of our worship, and he is the point of all of our worship. And so we threw out the usual script for today of prayer and some songs and some God's word and get out of here. Because it's all too easy, isn't it? It's all too easy for rhythm. Instead, I talk a little bit now and I'm going to get out of here because the worship team is now going to give you opportunities at length to spend time in worship, to reimagine, to have it reinvented in your mind what it really is, to not just get up and sing, sit yourself down and dwell on who the Lord is. Have conversation with him. Repent of your sin. Receive salvation. And then open your mouth. Sing songs of worship that declare about different things that God has done and is doing. And engage with the one on the throne as John describes him. That is what worship is. What worship should be. What we strive for it to be. So I'm going to pray here and the team now will lead us into opportunities for us to do that. Father God, I thank you that you are a God of revelation, that you reveal yourself to us when we have no right to demand it, that we have no designs on being good enough. We worship because of who you are and that your goodness doesn't just stay with you, that you share it with us. 
We worship for what you've done for us. We bring our imperfect, broken, not always with the right attitude, not always with the right intention, worship as just an offering. This is what we have to give. We bring our crowns of salvation and we put them down. We didn't earn those. Those are yours. We sing songs and we pray and ask that they will be glorifying to you. And in the midst of our worship, our thoughts of you will be reshaped and reformed yet again that we have not arrived in perfect view of you. You are so holy, so unimaginable, so good. Would you just draw us a little bit closer to understanding that today? In Jesus' name, amen. If you guys want to stand, we're going to get into some worship. And I just want to encourage you guys to worship however you feel called to. We're not here to put on a show. We're not here to look a certain way. So however you feel comfortable worshiping, go ahead and do that. Oh, God. 
Jesus, we just praise you. Thank you for all of the ways that you are so worthy. You are, you're just so incredible. You're so gracious and loving. We don't deserve anything that you have to give us, but you love us so much that you died so we could spend eternity with you. We just thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So you guys can go ahead and have a seat. So like Maddie said, it's a little bit of a different morning, almost afternoon. So um, as you can see, the worship team is scooting around back here. We have two teams this morning because there's so many amazing people on our worship team. Um, so as they're getting set up for the next few songs, I'm going to introduce myself and just talk about my journey with learning what worship is. So, hi, my name is Topanga. I'm the worship director here, and I've gotten to work alongside the other staff members and volunteers for over three years now, which is super crazy. I feel like I just got here. And I moved to Thief River over four years ago. And before I moved here, I really had no idea what worship actually meant. I thought that it was just a, a genre of music. So you have pop, rock, country, and worship. It's just songs about Jesus. They, they just have to put a name with it so it makes sense. And that's all that I really understood about it until I moved here and I was surrounded by people who were really diving into the Bible and I just wanted to learn so much more about what worship meant. And uh, like Maddie said, it's not about what we have to give because everything that we have and everything that we could ever be is not even close to enough to fully worship God. So I struggled with fully understanding that until I came here. And I don't know if you guys have played sports or did any competing growing up. I was in pageants and played basketball and did a bunch of sports. And the, the end goal is basically you want to win. You want to get the highest score. You want to win the crown. You want to be the best. So that's what I thought that worship was. I was like, okay, I need to be the best singer. I need to be able to hit all those fancy notes and sound like all the people on the radio. And I thought that's how I could worship the best. And uh, like Maddie said, that's not the case. Um, we obviously practice a lot and we want to sound good as a worship team, but that's not why we're up here. We're all up here because God has given us a gift to glorify him, not to glorify ourselves. Honestly, we would all be fine with the lights turned off so no one could see us. Honestly, we would all probably prefer that. Um, <laughs> So I just think that it's so crazy how my mindset has shifted so much in the last couple of years to me being so internally focused and worried about what everyone else was thinking about me. If I was raising my hands the right way or if my voice cracked a little bit, everyone was going to notice and be upset with me. And now I'm able to completely forget about all of those things and not care about it and just fully be in his presence and receive what he has for me. So we're going to get into four more songs of worship. So I invite you guys to worship however you feel comfortable, however you feel led. I know that it's a lot of standing, so if you guys aren't able to do that, that's fine. Sitting is okay too. Um, so we're going to get into the next song in our worship set. Free 
hearts in that posture of worship toward you this week that with every breath we take with every everything we do every 
everything that we are, everything we present ourselves as, that it will be a worshipful thing to you. I just pray that you'll keep us in that heart posture of worship. Um, and you'll just be teaching us how to do that better. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.